All right, it's good to see each of you here this morning. Look forward to our time of worship together. Let's take our Bibles and look together in Psalm 126 to begin our time of worship. When the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream. Then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. Then said they among the heathen, the Lord hath done great things for them. The Lord hath done great things for us, whereof we are glad. Turn again our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing bringing his sheaves with him. Let's ask the Lord's blessing as we worship together. Gracious Father, I thank you for your word. Without it, we would be nothing but dry earth. And yet as the dew comes down upon the mountaintop, and you cause the rain to fall upon dry ground, seed to be sown. It grows as you purposed according to the glory of your Son, that glory that you purposed in your Son. We do rejoice. The world looks at us and wonders how it is that we worship, even some consider what we, how we worship to be a cult, and yet the way that they find to be puzzlement is the way that you've taught us to worship, that the glory and honor belong unto your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ alone. And that regardless of what the world says, that those that you have so taught, we say the Lord hath done great things for us, whereof we are glad. And so I pray that as we gather again today, that you would indeed turn up the foul ground of these hearts and once again sow the seed of Christ within that in every aspect, not of just of this worship time, but as we go forth, that he would indeed be uppermost in our hearts and minds and that we would leave here rejoicing in who he is and all the glory that you've purposed through him. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for this time of worship. Thank you for your word. Thank you for each one that you've caused to be with us here, whether in this place or over the internet. And to your honor and glory, together, we would glorify and worship you. And we might for the give you the praise and honor and glory in your Savior's name. Amen. Let's take our bulletins and our inside cover. Sing this hymn to the tune of Come Thou Mount, Every Blessing. Praise 
Thessalonians chapter 2, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, the reading of the Lord's word. For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance in unto you, that it was not in vain. But even after that, we had suffered before, and were shamefully entreated. As ye know, at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanliness, nor in guile. But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, which trieth our hearts. For neither at any time use we flattering words, as ye know, nor a cloak of covetousness, God is witness. Nor are men sought we glory, neither of you, nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. We were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherished her children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you, not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because ye were dear unto us. For ye remember, brethren, our labor and travail, for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you, we preached unto you the gospel of God. Ye are witnesses, and God also, how holy and justly and unblameably we behave ourselves among you that believe. As ye know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you, as a father doeth his children, that ye would walk worthy of God, who has called you his kingdom and glory. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, Received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worship, worketh also in you that believe. Followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus, for ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and have persecuted us, and they please not God, and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved, to fill up their sins away always. For the wrath is come upon them to the uttermost. For we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored the more abundantly to see your face with great desire. Wherefore, we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us, for what is our hope, our, our joy, our crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus at his coming? For ye are our glory and joy. And pray. Father, we come before you now, and we praise a great God, worthy to be praised. Lord, let us rejoice in the word today. We rejoice in the, uh, the singing. Let our songs be to honor and praise God. Lord, we ask you to be with Brother Ken today. Open our hearts to the Word of God. We pray this in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's take our hymn books and turn to hymn number 176. Let's stand and sing this together. Break thou the bread of life, dear Lord, to me. Christ being that bread. 176. Thank you. 
myself, my my peace, my all in all. Thou art the bread of life, oh Lord, to me. Thy holy word of truth has saved me. chapter 2, as we continue our study through this book of the Acts. I know that it is titled the Acts of the Apostles, but as we have seen, it's probably better entitled the Acts of the Spirit, because it's all about the Spirit doing the work that Christ came and fulfilled. And causing that the word of Christ go forth into the world. And it all began there on the day of Pentecost, which again was purposed by God timely. Pentecost being the day when the first fruits of the harvest field were brought in and waved before the Lord in the Old Testament. Penta, 50 days after the Passover. How's that timely? Well, the Lord now causing his spirit to be poured out. And where is he? Where is this one who caused his spirit to be poured out? He's seated in the heavens. Everything that men did unto him is finished. He's no longer the sin bearer. They can no longer lay their hand upon him. He's no longer the man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. He fulfilled perfectly everything that his father gave him to do, and that's why he was raised again from the grave and received up into glory, given a name above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And that's really what Peter declared. The last time we looked at this portion, we did a broad view of what it is to preach the word using Peter's example, beginning right at the beginning. And preaching the word is to preach the word. It's to preach Christ. The living word, the eternal word, the incarnate word, the ever-living word, ever-reigning word. You cannot say enough about the word. And that was really the conclusion here in Acts chapter 2, when it was all said and done. Peter wasn't preaching about tongues. Uh, you can have this blessing if you just seek it enough. No. He says there in verse 36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, and again, which same Jesus? Well, the one they maligned and detested, verse 22, put amongst them, and yet they took him by wicked hands, crucified and slew. But even in that, they didn't do one thing more or less than what God ordained. He said, that same Jesus, he's now made whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. And so with that in mind, I want to come back to break down parts of this message for us to see it in its context. And Peter began this message in verse 16, explaining the pouring out of the Spirit there at Jerusalem, where these spoke in languages. That's very important. 
When you see the word tongue in scripture, it can either mean this member in our mouths refers to that, or a language. It never refers to gibberish. <laughs> it speaks of a language, and, and even here we know that these that spoke in Jerusalem spoke in languages in verse 9 all the way down to verse 11. It describes nations where these Jews that were in exile, dispersed, had come back to Jerusalem for the feast days, Passover and Pentecost. They, it was a long journey, so they usually came and celebrated both and then went back. And while they were there in Jerusalem, all of a sudden these Galileans that had never set foot outside the boundaries of Israel, suddenly speaking in the languages of these nations where they had been dwelt. I've never visited Russia. But if there were some Russians, some Americans that lived in Russia, let's put it that way, that were attending, and all of a sudden I began to speak of the glories of Christ in Russian, in a perfect Russian, those that knew Russian would be amazed. How is it that the, these from Galilee are speaking languages? That, that's what it says there. In verse 11, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. So this is very clearly a work of God. And so as some were amazed and some said he's got to be drunk, that's the natural way of responding to anything that God does supernaturally. They try to attribute it to something physical. Peter stands up and deals with that in one fell swoop in verse 15. They're not drunk. See, and it's but the third hour of the day. It's nine in the morning. You expect someone to be drunk at night, but not at nine in the morning. So, what does he do? Verse 16 goes right back to the scriptures. And again, anytime we have a message declared from the word, let it be from the word. This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. I have to say that this is a very controversial portion of Scripture, not because the Scriptures are unclear, but as with anything, men muddy the waters. And so when they read this, you'll find some that say, well, part of it was fulfilled in the first century, but we're still waiting for part of it to be fulfilled. If you're seeing double, what do you do? You go see an eye doctor, don't you? That's right. And you get your eyes checked. Anytime that you find people wanting, for some reason, they don't like necessarily how it fits the context, so they divide it up and say, well, maybe part of it, but we're still awaiting the full fulfillment of it in the end times. And that's really how people like to read this portion. They, they want to believe that somehow, regardless of what happened in the first century, there's still something to be fulfilled in our time. And they use this portion as a reason to give people license to do what they do in religion. But I don't know about you, the scriptures speak for themselves. In verse 16, he said, this is that which was spoken. He didn't divide it up. He went back there and said exactly what Joel prophesied is exactly what we've seen fulfilled today. And then verse 17, it shall come to pass in the last days. See, that's the issue right there with a lot of people. They said, well, it says the last days. Well, that's right. When did the last days begin? They began when Christ came the first time. There are a lot of people today scheming and planning and talking about the second coming of Christ who've never really believed the first coming. They've never believed why he came the first time. But here, it shall come to pass in the last days, it says, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. This is the part where a lot of 
those that hold to charismatic or Pentecostal preaching today find their reason of support for letting men and women alike preach because it says here that your young men shall see visions and your your old men shall dream dreams, but also says your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. That word prophesy in scripture doesn't necessarily mean to foretell the future. That's how most people do it. So you've got these people today and they'll fall back on this scripture verse that will stand up and say, I've received a revelation from God. You've seen them standing there as if God's literally talking in their ear and they're in somewhat of a trance and then God said or God told me to, that this is the language of our day. And for this reason, there are many who based upon this movement, which really, if you go back and study a little bit on the history of the charismatic and the Pentecostal movement began back in the middle 1800s, and it's carried over across denominations. That ought to tell you something right there. They all get along. It's a one world religion that's based not only on works, but on new revelation. Well, I can tell you based upon this word that there is no new revelation today that is being given to anybody. If anybody comes and says that they've received a new word from God, for our generation, you can mark them down as being a false prophet. Back here in Revelation, if you go, like I've told you to do, when I read books, I usually read the last chapter to figure out how it's going to end, then I go back and read the book. <laughs> See if I like how it's developed. But here in Revelation chapter 22, we're warned here. In verse 17, well, in verse 16, I, Jesus, so that's who this book is about. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. Who is he? He's God. He's the word. I, Jesus, has sent mine angel, that word is my messenger, to testify unto you these things in the churches. And again, that word angel means that. It means a messenger. It's not like he sent a created angelic being, but as we read the first part of Revelation, every one of those churches to the angel of the church of Ephesus or of Thyatira or Smyrna, the angel means the messenger. I trust that I'm an angel of the Lord for you today. I know that doesn't sound right. I'm anything but an angel in that sense, but it's a messenger. And here his messenger to these churches was John. So he's affirming again the writing of this, this word. He said, I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. Again, there's that I am. The great I am, Jehovah God, and the spirit and the bride say, come. Everything about Christ through the spirit is to his honor and glory. Let him that heareth say, come. In other words, our desire is not only for the presence of Christ now, but his coming again. Here again is where I say a lot of people talk about the second coming and never understood the first. They, they're they waiting for someone to come the second time that they've never known the first time. Because the Jesus that's being preached today is another Jesus. It's a popular Jesus, but he's not the one described here as the root and offspring of David. In other words, the fulfillment of everything that God said should take place through that seed of David. That's who he is in his humanity. You see, but who is he in his divinity? The bright morning star. You see both aspects of the Lord Jesus Christ here as the root and offspring of David. That's his humanity. But the bright and morning star, that's, that's the sun. That's his divinity. But 
Who is it that hears? It's the one to whom the hearing is given. Who is it that thirsts? Let him that is a thirst come. How are we drawn to this Christ except for it has been given to us to know him? Life in Christ. And whosoever will, we're not afraid of that expression. It doesn't say whosoever won't. Whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. How does one will to take of the water of life freely? Really, it's God that makes his people willing in the day of his power. Mm-hmm. So it's just identifying those who in this world the Lord has purposed to save and that he does in time draw to himself. Now here's the part I want you to see. There's no new revelation being given. When the Lord sealed this revelation here and John was the last to, to write these words as the Spirit of God directed him, He was also careful to write this. I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. It's not just the book of Revelation. That word book is the word we get our word Bible from. Biblios. So read it that way. I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this Bible. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this Bible, this book. And if any man shall take away, so let's be careful not to impose our own interpretations. As Peter describes those that rest the scriptures to their own destruction because they would have it say something or mean something other than that which gives Christ glory. If any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life. I don't believe God is taking names out of the book that he's put in there, but it's a way of speaking that any hope that a person had, that his name might be in that book of life, the Lord will take away any any falsehood and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. He which testifieth these things saith, surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Come even as you reveal yourself. I truly believe that whether in death or the Lord's coming at the end of the age, if I'm still alive and you're still alive, that Christ will not be any different than how he has revealed himself here. On the other hand, there are many people that go into eternity presuming to see a Jesus that is just a figment of their imagination, only to find out that they've been cast into utter darkness because they've never known the true and living God in the person of Jesus Christ. And so here... Amen, even so come Lord Jesus. Not the Jesus of men's mandate, but the Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. So I say that because there's a lot of emphasis here in verse 17 of Acts 2 on us being in the last days because now there is that pouring out of the Spirit. So they say, whereby you have all these people running to and fro, and men, women, daughters, prophesying, seeing visions. I will tell you that in this context here, again, coming back to verse 16, where Peter declares, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. He's talking about what would take place in his day, in that time. And so I believe reading down through here, what we're reading about is what should take place from the time that the Spirit was poured out on that day all the way to the destruction of Jerusalem. Peter here is describing, according to what Joel said should take place, in that very era in which he was raised up to preach and the other apostles as well. And when we read through the book of Acts, we do have examples 
here of men and women going forth and testifying to the world. It's not, not that these are condoning women preachers, but when it says your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, again, prophesying is to foretell the glories of this very one that you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, here's that seed that the Lord's raised up that will testify even against you, this Jewish generation, in their day. Remember what the Lord said as he was going to Calvary and those women were weeping for him. He said, don't weep for me, but weep rather for yourselves because your house is left to you desolate. I believe as we read on here, this is the period of time now that Peter is talking about, that while these that were left, Christ had died, risen, ascended on high, they saw him no more. And those Jews went right back to their old customs. They, they sewed up that veil that was rent in twain on the day of Christ's crucifixion, and they continued to offer their sacrifices like nothing was. And Peter's in essence saying, have at it, but there's a limited time where that's going to happen. And then the Lord's going to come again, but not in a way that you met. He's going to come again in the destruction of Jerusalem. But in the meantime, this period of time between this pouring out of the Spirit and then, God is going to cause, that's what it says there in verse 7, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. That clearly doesn't mean upon everybody in the world, but as we've already seen in Acts 2, ethnically, it's speaking of people from every tribe, kindred, and tongue. God is going to cause this world, this word to go forth into the world. What kind of world? The Gentile world. You couldn't have said anything to a Jew that would offend them more. Not only did they deny Christ was the Messiah, but especially the way he died, no way he could be the Messiah, not the one they were looking for. And especially now, you're taking this to Gentile dogs? See, that's the thing about them speaking and them hearing every man in their own tongue. These were not Jewish tongues. This was tongues of the world. And yet, what was God declaring by that, that he had a people throughout the world that wasn't necessarily of the Jewish descent, and that every one of them he would cause to be brought to himself, but also that those that are his in the world would testify, whether man or woman, young man or old, anyone upon whom that spirit was given and poured out, they would indeed testify to the glory of Christ. And that's why he says in verse 18, and on my servants and on my handmaids, that's all we are before God is servants and handmaids. And yet he says, I will pour out in those days of my spirit and they shall prophesy. Again, that word prophesy in the sense, they will declare my glory. That's what it is to prophesy is to declare the glory of Christ, any upon whom God has put that spirit. How do you know the spirit of God is in them? Well, they declare his glory. And when it says here in those days, don't pull it out of the context. It's the same days as in verse 16 where Peter said, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. So let's keep it in the context. And I believe that the fulfillment of this is what we're going to read in the rest of the book of Acts. And just how that takes place. The gospel beginning in Jerusalem, going to Samaria, from Samaria to the uttermost parts of the world. God is going to have his people. Now, when you come to verse 19, I believe that here, this is describing the destruction of Jerusalem. It's not speaking of the end of the world, per se, because, again, in the context, he says, this is that which was spoken by Joel. We've, we've gone over 2,000 years since this was done, 
But you still have people looking at verse 19 saying, we've got to hurry up because the end of the world's coming and we've got to be busy about getting the, the gospel out. What they call the gospel. Each one reach one. Try to get as many saved before time's up. It's like a, a game that we're racing against the clock here. As many as we can get in before the time runs out, the better. But that's not what this is talking about. See, verses 16 to 18 is the Lord describing that his word is going to go forth regardless. He'll cause it to prosper to that end that he's purposed. But when it says here in verse 19, and I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor, of smoke. What does that sound like to you but destruction? The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. What great and notable day of the Lord coming was he describing? I believe it was describing the destruction of Jerusalem. That they as a nation that that temple as a place of worship would cease to exist. And when it talks about wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood, fire, and vapor of smoke, I know I keep referring to Josephus here as an example of what you can read to describe what that destruction would have been like back in the day, but that's how they destroyed cities. And when God brought in Titus and the Roman government, the army, and they surrounded that place with their armies and put a siege on it, and then when it was in a weakened state, came in and attacked and literally just burned everything. When it says the sun shall be turned to darkness, there's so much smoke that even the daytime, you couldn't see the sun. And when it says the moon and the blood, that's a description in Scripture of judgment that at a time when there would have been a full moon, when you looked at it, the moon into blood, we talk about the blood moon today. I don't know whether you could go back and actually show that there was one of these, this was the time of a blood moon. You've just gone through that recently, even here, and we're amazed as we see how the moon is at that particular time so close to the earth. But the Lord was indicating that at, at this time, there's going to be death and destruction. And it's called here before that great and notable day of the Lord come. I believe what is being described, as I said here, is the destruction of Jerusalem that the Lord himself said should come and that Luke wrote about when he was describing how Jerusalem would be surrounded by all of the armies of Rome. If you look back here in Luke chapter 22, I wrote down the wrong reference in my notes, but anyway, Luke describes how the, the city would be surrounded by the armies of Jerusalem and that when they saw that taking place, that they should prepare to leave the city and to to run. I have to find that later for you. I know we've gone over it before, but not to get distracted by that. But I believe that's what's being described here in Acts chapter 2. It's talking about that great and noble day of the Lord coming. I know that we're awaiting the coming of the Lord in the last day, but there's no question that he came again in power and in glory in uh, 70 A.D., when the Lord, is it Luke 21? I knew someone would help me out eventually. Luke chapter 21, not 22. Yes, thank you. Notice in verse 20, Luke 21, 20. The Lord said, And when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh, then let them which are in 
Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out, and let not them that are in the countries enter there into. Notice, for these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. So even when it's when Peter says here that this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, it was written. He's describing, you can read it in Daniel as well, that these things might be fulfilled. This is what Daniel in Daniel 9 described as the abomination of desolation that should come upon that city. No one believed it. They were just like in the Old Testament when God destroyed the, the temple the first time. Everybody said, the temple, the temple. We have the temple. The temple is not the brick and mortar. The temple is the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ and what it represents. But they were willing to have that temple. Even in Christ's day, they were, they were swearing by the gold on the temple. <laughs> that was all their hope, that temple. And yet it was just nothing but an empty tomb, especially once Christ had fulfilled it. Christ had said that, destroy this temple in three days, I'll raise it again. He, he was letting them know that that temple, that system of sacrifices, the priesthood, all these things, their time was fulfilled. It was done. When Christ said it's finished, it was finished. So for these to set him aside and to continue to worship as if nothing was, this is what Joel was speaking of as that day of destruction that would come upon them. And that's why it says in verse 23, but woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. For there shall be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. And Robert read about it there in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 where Paul described how wrath had come upon the Jewish people to the uttermost, not just in the destruction of Jerusalem, but in the, the eternal condemnation. So all of this is what Peter is describing here by saying, you think this is an amazing thing that the spirit of Christ has been poured out at this time and you marvel at what you're seeing here? This spirit is given that those that are truly the Lord's should go forth and prophesy or testify of this very one that you have taken and crucified and slain. But woe be to you because the day is coming when there's going to be a desolation that not even you would believe. And the Jews couldn't believe. And yet Josephus describes it. There, he says there are over 1.1 million people that perished in the destruction of Jerusalem back in the day, where literally the streets were so narrow the blood was flowing up the horse's bridles of death and destruction. You say, well, what kind of God would do that? A God of justice, a God of holiness. You want to know just how much God loves his son? <laughs> it's of no consequence for God to cast people into utter darkness and eternity who have not known the Lord Jesus Christ and bowed to him. Such is the destruction. That's what it says here. Woe unto them that are with child and, and that give give suck in those days. That's that's a mother that's just given birth to a baby. What's her major concern? It's her child. So not only she has fear for her own life, but now for this baby. But the Lord describes it here as a great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, verse 24, and shall be led away captive into all nations. Interestingly, the very nations that they turn their nose up at are those nations that the Lord's are. Right. You don't think you think yourself better than these nations because they're idolaters? I'm going to take you into captivity of those nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the time, the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. The times of the Gentiles is the, the times that God has purpose. And I'll tell you, even today, that nation of Israel isn't on its own. It's still trodden down by the Gentiles. 
if it weren't for the Gentiles offering their help and supports, and I speak now specifically of the United States, that, that, that nation would probably be destroyed. There's nothing that they can boast in. But here's the part I wanted you to see in verse 25 that pertains to what we're reading about here in Acts chapter 2, where he said, I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. It says here, there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. See, this is the God of the earth shaking his earth. Men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth and for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Now, you have to keep all this in its context in verse 20. When ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies. So that's why even here, when it says in verse 27, then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. It's not talking about coming at the end of time. He came with a cloud and with power and great glory in the destruction of Jerusalem. His hand was in every part. Of it. He working from his throne. When you read the book of Revelation, that's what it's all about. Where is Christ today? He's reigning. He's shaking this earth. He's bringing to pass everything that this, this happens in this earth, whether it's famine or war. It's the Lord shaking out the wheat from the tares, sifting it as he will. And it says, when these things begin to come to pass, you can't pull it out of the context. It's still verse 20. When you see Jerusalem surrounded as it was, those that are alive in that day, when you see these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draws nigh. In other words, those that were the Lord's looked up and saw his hand even in this. It's like we are today. You know, when things take place and the earth is shaken, and the, the world scurries like ants in an anthill trying to figure it all out. Where do we look? We look to the one who's, from whose hand all these things are coming. And there we find our rest and our peace. So I believe that that's what's described. And, and it certainly was a great notable day of the Lord. Great notable because the Lord purposed it and fulfilled it exactly as he said should take place. And now verse 21 Again, in its context, it says, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Regardless of all of this that the Lord purposed to bring on Jerusalem, that the Lord had his people, even in this era, that come hell or high water, as we say, they were the Lord's. Now, again, we always have to make clear the interpretation of Scripture because today when people read calling on the name of the Lord, they think that means saying a so-called sinner's prayer. But that's not what it is to call on the name of the Lord. When he says here, it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord, it's talking about worshiping him in truth. The reason I say that is if you go back to Genesis chapter 4, the first time this expression is used, and I would encourage you to take your Bible and look through all of Scripture, run it through your concordance, to call on the name of the Lord. It's not this modern-day prayer that's put in people's mouths to where a preacher says to them, if you just say this prayer after me, you can be sure of heaven is your own name. No. Here in Genesis chapter 4 and verse 26, this was after Cain had slain Abel, and the Lord raised up another seed, it says, instead of Abel. There was that seed through which Christ should come, and the Lord preserved that seed alive. It says in verse 26, and to Seth, to him also there was born a son, and he called his name Enos, and notice, then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. How? Worshiping God exactly as Abel had worshipped him. How did Abel worship him? It was through a blood sacrifice. That lamb representing the, the person of Christ, the, the shed blood of the lamb representing his work. So fast forward. Who are those that call upon the name of the Lord? They are 
ones like ourselves that have a simple but direct way of worshiping God. It's not in fanfare and it's not in visions and, and all the hoopla that you see going on in religion today. It's coming before God in that way that God has ordained that we should come through the blood and righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ alone. And I will tell you, those are the ones who call on the name of the Lord because they've been so taught of the Lord. So, again, in the midst of all of this judgment that was being pronounced and written by the prophets that should fall upon Jerusalem in that day, yet, another way of putting it is the Lord had his remnant of grace. And I love the way it's put there in Romans chapter 11. There is this day, present day, to this this present day, there's there's a remnant according to the election of grace. And this thing is not going to be wrapped up until every last one that God has purposed to save and Christ is redeemed and be brought unto himself. Regardless of what his judgments are in the world, I've often said to you that the Lord will shake up entire nations. Because as we read on here in the book of Acts, during this time, leading up to the destruction of Jerusalem, there was persecution. They couldn't get their hands on Christ, so they sought to kill his seed. And yet in all that, the Lord's will was being accomplished in carrying the gospel out into the world. He'll shake up entire nations to shake out even one of his elect. One of the most impressive moments of my life was a time where there was a war going on in Liberia. We were in the Ivory Coast, and atrocities unimaginable. People getting slain with machetes and bloodshed, and families destroyed and killed. And I still remember being invited to go preach to a group of refugees that were over right on the border that escaped for their lives, had nothing. They, they left with nothing but the clothes on their back, and some of them bruised and battered. And I remember the Lord giving me the opportunity to stand there and preach to, I don't know how many there were. And I, I still remember one of those escapees coming up afterward and saying to me, you know, I would not have heard this gospel, this message today, had not all of this taken place. And I've lost my entire family, all dead. But here I am today listening to the good news of Jesus Christ I wouldn't have heard otherwise. You talk about given honor and glory to God alone, even in such circumstances. And I believe that's the sense here. All of this that was being predicted that should fall on this nation, yet the promise here is that everyone that the Lord has purposed, they shall call on the name of the Lord, and, and that is their salvation. That's the proof of their salvation. It's not that if you call, then you'll be saved. No. It's that our safety and our, our security and our hope and salvation is in the fact that he's given us even that cry to call unto him and to worship him in this one manner that he's ordained. Well, there's a lot more there that we could go over, but I'm going to stop there. We'll come back to the next part next time. It's one of the good things about the word. We can always come back to it. Turn to hymn number 172. Understand it. Sing this together. O oh, Word of God incarnate. In number 172. It floated like a banner 
before God's most unfurled, it shined like a beacon above a darkling world. It is the chart and compass that o'er my searching sea. Well, we'll see you next time when we're supposed to.